friends, welcome to the show. I'm your host, Jesse Hubbard, and this is Sound Out. With me today is a very special guest with a brand new project out. We're going to talk all about photographer Nikki Germain. How are you? Welcome to the show. Hi, Jesse. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Um, we've had an opportunity to chat a couple times now, and I've enjoyed it so much. I've been really looking forward to like capturing uh, one of these conversations on the show here. Um, and let's just talk about you know, what you're here to do and, and, and talk about this brand new project that you have out. Uh, Bruce Springsteen, Liberty Hall. It's making the rounds right now. You're talking about it. It's a brand new book full of incredible photography. Take us through that and tell us a little bit about what's going on with that. Well, it's interesting. I never, I never knew that I was going to do a book, and it it was. And I these are previously unpublished photographs. That one photograph was published in Rolling Stone. Back in September of 1974, when Bruce made a return trip to Texas, and Liberty Hall had a had a show for them in Houston, and there were a couple other shows around uh, Texas as well. But um, when I I was 26 years old when I shot these photographs, I had I was working in a commercial photography studio with one photographer, one very fine photographer, and I was. Um, I was pretty confident about the work I did in the studio, but not as confident about my own shooting. I was always questioning, you know, what I was doing. I had studied photography at the University of Texas with Russell Lee, who was one of the WPA photographers. I was a, a fine arts student. And um, so my whole approach to photography wasn't about rock and roll in particular. It was about anything that I shot. You know, it was about really about capturing that image that would be unique or special, but I honestly questioned everything I did back when I was 26 years old. I wasn't anywhere Did you near. have a, a particular style of photography that you really enjoyed the most, or were you just looking for anything that was an interesting shot at that period? Anything that, anything that interested me, actually, uh, I would say more, not necessarily street photography, but just anything. And I was a big fan of Ralph Gibson, who really had a very... Uh, almost geometric sort of uh, approach to uh, the image. But I also was really uh, a big fan of Mary Ellen Mark, who did a lot of documentary work, some pretty tough stuff, you know, like uh, yeah. the prostitutes in India. And she basically lived with them. And then the street kids uh, and Diane Arbus and a lot of those, I sort of gravitated more towards that. But, but what happens with a lot of photographers, especially when they're young, they are very um, uncomfortable shooting people close up and personally because it's because to get those kinds of images, you have to get close. You can't stand back and use a long lens to get an intimate shot. And uh, so I was also a big fan of Annie Leibovitz, who at that time was staff photographer at Rolling Stone. Sure. Um there were a lot of really interesting sort of serendipitous things that happened. You know, I had met the the photographer, the I'm sorry, the art director for Rolling Stone magazine, Mike Salisbury, who I met in our studio when we had um they had a, an event there annually called the Art Directors Club event where they would invite judges in every year who were um, well known in their in their field with, with Mike, it was art direction, and also he was a wonderful. He's a wonderful photographer, uh, so multi talented. And he was also art directing uh, West Magazine, and he was teaching at Art Center. So um, I had met Mike, and surprisingly, he called me up uh, about a couple months after I met him. I think it was in November of seventy three, and asked me to shoot an assignment for Rolling Stone and I was flabbergasted. And this was, you know, never going to be a way to make a living. I mean, there was no money in it shooting that. But but it was something fun to do outside of what I was doing as uh, someone who was running a professional photography studio doing stuff for all the oil companies and banks and art and and that sort of thing. And uh I I I was very prolific in the dark room at, by that time. I really had learned so much from Ron. So um, my first assignment was to shoot the Smothers Brothers on their return, oh, cool. on their return <laughs> back to performing after years after they had been kicked off the network. 
and uh, Alpha CBS. So I actually shot the Smothers Brothers at the end of March in Dallas. So the assignment had come to me before I actually uh, at, before I shot Bruce, but I shot Bruce and the band before I shot the Smothers Brothers. So I hadn't even published anything and had anything published in Rolling Stone at that time. So, were, so were you, I, I read, um, I don't know if it's true or not, but I read that you were uh, the house photographer for Liberty Hall. Is that accurate or no, is that not true? No, no, no. Uh, no uh, they didn't have one, you know, okay. as far as I know. People, what happened was, and I didn't go there all the time, you know, I would go there if I was something that really interested me. But Roberto Gonzalez, who who managed Liberty Hall and was one of the owners, was such a nice guy. And, I, and he let me shoot. And there were no minders there. I mean, you could, and I was, you know, if you're 26 and kind of a nice looking 26 year old woman, you know, girl, uh, and you show up with a camera, not too many people are going to object back in those days. You know, I mean, now it's a different story. Where's your credentials? They don't care. You know, you're, you're not yeah, getting in. Yeah. But, but back then it was a, it was a ticket. To get in and the seventies uh, were a different time. Yeah, you could do it. Course, <laughs> that's awesome. <laughs> so, um, and I was a pretty serious person. I was not. I was definitely not a groupie type. <laughs> that was not my thing. But um, so I was very really seriously interested yeah. in the photography. And then what I would do, um, when, whoever I would shoot, you know, I would give Roberto some pictures for the hall. That's how the uh, first pictures okay. really got out there because they they. They were they were picked up somehow came out on the internet of the band in front of Liberty Hall and uh, Roberto and the Hall gave me credit so I always seemed to get a credit for that picture you know wherever it wound up showing up uh, and <clears throat> so the the only picture that was ever published out of the four nights that I shot at Liberty Hall which was uh, Thursday Friday Saturday and Sunday. Um, uh, I shot all those four nights, but the only picture that was ever really published that was one that year was uh, for Rolling Stone for an article they, they ran in September of 74 when Bruce returned back with the band, different version of the band, yeah. the current version, uh, 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 when they came back to Texas. And that's when... Um, Rolling Stone ran a full page article and they which is, called which is very cool. Me, yeah, that's yeah. A, that's that's a I mean that's a big deal in and of itself. So yeah, they paid me fifty bucks, but uh, you know, <laughs> the, the, having the, the photograph in, in Rolling Stones cooler than the money. It's that's yeah, fifty bucks, well, whatever. Cool. But like, yeah. When I, when I called them to find out if I could run the full page article in the book along with the picture that it was ran, they couldn't give me permission or not one way or the other because they didn't even know who owned the copyright for for the text. Huh. I had the copyright for the the photograph, but the text they didn't know, and there was no record of it. So I had to make sure that I. Well, you you can run part of it, but you can't run the whole page, you know. So, yeah, yeah. you know, I I thought, well, that's a shame, but but I do have the whole the whole article. I fortunately saved some of the the magazine, so which was back then a newsprint. So they're you know they're a little. That's Not that's good. Great, that's true. You're right. Shit. Yeah. They yeah, were all newsprint. You know, they were newsprint. You could fold over. And yeah. Like, uh, yeah. Or these big newsprint uh, magazines. Yeah. So here we are. It's 1974, mm -hmm. and you're on assignment to shoot uh, Bruce and the band. Not yet the E Street mm -hmm. Band, right? They were just the, nope. the the band. Um, and you didn't really know too much about them. This is kind of your introduction. Uh, I knew nothing. Free fame. Bruce Springsteen in the in the band, right? Never so, heard of him. <laughs> yeah, which is which is which is wild to think about. There's a world when people hadn't heard about them, you know. But this oh, was it's, it's not New Jersey, you know. Yeah, that's I mean, true. <laughs> it's, it's still kind of that way, you know. In a way, I mean, if you ask anybody on the East Coast, you mentioned Bruce Springsteen, everybody goes what crazy. It doesn't yeah. matter what you do yeah. for a living there. Everybody, but back, but back then, yeah, not not everybody knew not everybody knew them yet, which no. is crazy. So yeah. So they had they had come out with their first two records and uh, which were not commercial successes. And Bruce was kind right. of on the hook to come up with something really, really good in order to be kept on by the by the label. And that's a famous story. We don't need to go into it. But um, yeah. 
but that's when I met them at this time when things were really dicey, you know. So it was a very it was a very serious environment. What what had happened was I had met the CBS record promoter for uh for Bruce and, and Billy Joel and others and, and Mike Pilot, who was living in, in Houston. I'd met him, we can't remember how, but we did we we knew each other. And um he called me up one day and he said, Nikki, there's a band I want you to meet. Grab your camera. Come on down to Liberty Hall. So there was no assignment. It was just come on down and be my guest and show up and bring your camera. And I get down there and um, backstage was one big room with fluorescent lights with a bunch of folding chairs and a little and lots of old posters and and uh, no special dressing rooms or anything like that. And uh, and and I just started shooting and and I got to meet everybody and, and there was a the first night <coughs> excuse me <coughs> I'm sorry I'm getting drink water here the first night oh, yeah. that's funny you're talking about that that dressing room I imagine it's slightly different uh, you know since <laughs> 1974 for the guy yeah it's a lot different. But, <laughs> The a floor, Not giant fluorescent room with a bunch of folding chairs. Well, that it's one of the reasons why I like that one photograph in the book of Clarence looking back at me with there's legs of the girl's legs and you can it's kind of dates the pictures by the style of the shoes and all that and then the clothes. But that's the that's the room. That's the room. You can oh, see the yeah. guy sitting in the background. And uh yeah, it was it was very comfortable to, actually to be in that room. It was never awkward because everybody was all together. You know, there was no awkwardness about it, at least not in my opinion. Um, so I don't remember my conversations with anybody except with Clarence because he was, he was a people person, you know, so I learned all about his life and that sort of thing. I can't remember if it, I'm sure it wasn't the first night, but after the first night, I came back all the next three nights. And what had happened was then the first night, uh, the local public radio station always broadcast Thursday nights at Liberty Hall. Mike, Mike Pilot knew that, and he invited the media. He invited uh, radio uh, hosts and, and the newspaper reviewers, and all these people were invited, and he had guaranteed the house or 50% of the house at any rate, he had guaranteed a certain number of tickets to be sold in case there was a problem. But after the first night, and because it was on the radio, because the reviews were outstanding the the next day, they had to add three more shows. So instead of having one show every night, they had, for the next three nights, they had two shows. Wow. They sold wow. out. Every show. And it, it just took off like wildfire. All they had to do was hear. And the other thing is, uh, I, Bruce and the band were invited to, Bruce was invited to come into one of the radio stations. And then he came, he was invited to come back and bring the band. And they actually did a live performance in the radio station. So, oh, man. and then oh, cool. from there, they went on to Austin to live to Armadillo where they were really waiting for them. You know, so waiting this was really, them. this was really, I mean, on the, Verge on after a couple albums that are phenomenal albums and everybody loves now, but at the time they were not commercial successes. Nope. And and this is captures such a moment in time, mm -hmm. fifty years ago when they were just on the verge of stardom, but you didn't know how it was going to go, and you happened to be there and meet these guys and take these photos. So why now? After <laughs> I guess it was last year when the book came out. Right. Yes. Um, so after yes. such a long time, did you decide yes. that you wanted to share these photos with with the world? Well, I wouldn't say I wanted to. <laughs> that was like <laughs> um, I had uh, I had a lot of trepidation about it because Fair enough. you know I'm I'm going to be seventy seven years old in May, and I'm thinking I worked all, my whole life and I for to have fun when I quit working and I just like uh and when you do a book it's work you know I mean the doing of the book was really fun the marketing of the book is it's work it's hard you've got to move books you have yeah. especially when yeah. you're self-published and I'll go into that in a minute why I'm self-published but um 
the books have the the prints for the most part the the negatives and the transparency sat on the shelf all this time. Uh, what happened was, and I'm I'm going to really fast forward here. This will get too long. Over the years, every once in a while, <clears throat> I had some connection. <clears throat> excuse me, with Gary. Um, I would say we were sort of friends. You know, we liked each other. We 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 uh, we touched base once in a while, but we went our separate way. We had our separate lives, and and I didn't really think about it much until um it was new year's day of uh 2011 i got a phone call from i thought it was a robo call kind of thing or uh and uh i thought i'm not answering it i didn't know what it was and i, and I was a real estate agent at the time i was just on practically burned out so i said i'm not picking up that call not today and then I listened to my voicemail and I went, what the heck? And it was Gary calling me and he was living in Whitefish, Montana at the time. <clears throat> and um, we, it was really nice to hear his voice. He just sounded great, you know, and I, and uh, he, he said, do you by any chance have those photographs? And I said, somewhere. Sure. And this is what happened, and I told Bill Whitbeck this later on. Bill Whitbeck, who was 17 years old at the time, had come to Liberty Hall for a show with one of his friends. It was the Saturday night show, and he went crazy for the music and, and loved Gary's bass playing. And after the show, he went out with his buddies, and they went looking for the Springsteen recordings and they had a hard time finding it but they found some in pasadena texas oh. which is right outside houston <clears throat> from, from that that weekend oh wow yeah he, they Very were cool. right out, 17 years old and he he became a bass player <clears throat> and he was his last band he played with was robert earl keen and robert earl keen is just retired but bill is a bass player living in texas and um he he was had was writing an article in, about I guess it was Liberty Hall. I, I need to go back and read the article, but he was writing an article for a, a a base magazine and about Gary and his playing at Liberty Hall. And he had called him and asked him if he had any pictures that he could use for the article. So that was why Gary got in touch with me. And he said, I said, Oh, I need some pictures. Sure. You know, let me go back and see what I got and I'll be happy to send them to you. And, um, so I did. And, but we had a nice, Gary and I had a really nice conversation. I said, what are you doing in whitefish, et cetera, et cetera. What are you doing? I said, well, I'm selling real estate. Anyway, I also had found these five rolls of triax. And I said, you know, I, I got back in touch with Gary and I said, you know, I have these other, photographs but I'm, I'm gonna have to have them scanned and i'll put them on a disc and send them to you and see what you think he had seen a couple of the pictures because i had made a couple of pictures for the band and given them to him when you know after the show but um but he hadn't seen the, all those so when he got them he goes oh my god nikki you've got to do something with these and it's the said, first time he had ever seen them majority of them all of them see he had seen oh, wow. a couple of things but yeah you know, he had, I think he'd seen a couple of the colors. That's really cool. So I just said, oh, I can't possibly do anything. I work 24 seven, you know, and yeah. I was, I was and, and I had a real estate career in Sonoma and that was just, I didn't get a day off. So um, I said, I can't even think about it, but I did start to think about it a little bit. And I, by, I think it was in 2014, I started looking into it a little more seriously. I got in touch with uh, a, a fellow in uh, Rocky Kenworthy in Asheville, North Carolina, <clears throat> who had been referred to me by a friend who was a big collector of photography. And I also have a photography, I have a photography collection. Uh, and uh, I started collecting back in the early 80s, other photographers' works. And uh, so, um, at any rate, I'm just getting my train of thought back here. So, yeah, we were talking I a little bit about, yeah. I started, yeah, I started exploring it. And, yeah. 
<clears throat> I was initially going to just do some prints, but Rocky sat me down and said, start going through all the things that I needed to do and how I needed to document, and write. And I said, I don't have time for this. But I really don't. So again, got it kind of put more on the shelf, but at least I'd sort of started a process, you know, and I started looking at like what images might be in, of interest to someone. And, and then I'll fast forward again. I get another phone call from Gary in 2018. And uh, we start talking for about, we start talk for about three months. He was uh, going through a divorce. I was still living in Sonoma, but I was retiring. And I had planned to move to New Orleans where I have a lot of friends and I love the culture and they're very, very much into the arts. They're very supportive of artists. So I knew I could have a really great fun life there. Well, who wouldn't have fun in New Orleans? So <laughs> you know, you have way too much fun in New Orleans. Sure. So um, we started talking and um, Gary uh, eventually came out to California and, uh, and we started seeing each other long distance and it was just really very easy. It was a very, it's a very easy relationship. It's very comfortable. And then he knew I was planning on moving to New Orleans and, and he asked me if I could consider coming to Nashville. And I said, well, that depends. <laughs> so, um, I decided to, um, uh, take him up on his offer and move to, uh, to Nashville. And then shortly thereafter COVID, uh, lockdown hits and we wound up being sequestered and which actually I thought was great because man, first time I didn't, I could just do whatever I want and not work. <laughs> and this is really great. And, uh, and then one day he said, uh, do you mind if I send some of these pictures to Bruce? And I went, uh Oh, you know, I, I went, <laughs> so he did. And we, and Gary so and I, a had moment of truth, about, right? <laughs> I, well, Gary and I had talked a little bit about me doing a book and I said, there's only one way I would do a book. I said, first of all, I would have to get Bruce's blessing. I said, I'm not, I'm not going to do a book without his blessing. And, um, and then that, that was one thing. The other thing is I, it had to be a beautiful book. It had to be because I came from, I had a collection of photography books. I had collected photography. It had to be something different than just your typical book of rock and roll photographs. It had to be something more like a presentation of the photograph, you know, and what each one of those photographs meant. And, um, and it had to be a real high quality book. Well, uh, Bruce and I talked the afternoon after he got the pictures on a text message from Gary. And I said, well, I'm thinking about doing a book, but I just, I just wouldn't do it without your blessing. He said, what can I do to help? And I said, well, we know you can write. <laughs> so, <laughs> so he, he, he laughed and, I, and, and, and ultimately, you know, he wrote the, the forward of the preface for the book. So that was one thing. Every, it was like the stars aligned. It was like meant to happen at this time. Yeah. It was everything became, was so fell into place so easily. First, there was Bill Whitbeck, and then uh, who who made the initial introduction to by calling Gary that time, and and then Gary introducing me via the the uh, uh, text message to Bruce and Bruce's blessing. Another thing that happened, a friend of mine in, in, Nash, in, in Napa, California had published a beautiful book of photographs of a traveling circus, um, uh, Norma I. Quintana, and she had used this wonderful book designer in uh, Weehawken, New Jersey, uh, Yolanda Cuomo. And Yolanda was doing all, all kinds of beautiful art books, but she did Pete Sousa's books as well. And um, so I did just thought, oh no, she's not going to be interested in picture of Bruce Springsteen. And, oh yes, she was. She's from New Jersey. <laughs> you know, so <laughs> say, say no more. So, so um, 
she she wanted to do it and then so i had i had my book designer fantastic fantastic well it didn't wouldn't have been the same book without yolanda for sure uh, no question and um so there was that and and um uh tony garnier had i met behind the theater in tulsa who plays bass for dylan and nice super nice guy we were chatting to for like we had like five minutes because that's about all you get back stick back behind the theater before Dylan makes yeah. the bus take off, and um, mm-hmm. turns out he is. He, I knew he had played with Asleep at the Wheel, and, and back in Texas, I knew he had played with him, and and uh, that's how he and Gary knew each other because when he left there and went to New York, Gary helped set him up and meet some people and get some gigs up there, and um, so. Uh, he said, you know, Nikki, I, I said, you know, uh, first of all, I said, I know I saw you at Liberty Hall because I saw Asleep at the Wheel at Liberty Hall. And um, he said, you know, I think I have a poster. I said, of the Springsteen show? I said, were you there? He said, no, but I think I have a poster. Wow. So he sent me the poster that we could scan for the book because other than that, the only thing I could find was on the Internet and yeah. It wasn't that great, but he, super. So th- that came together. It, the stars aligning for this. I mean, I mean it's it just when you think about the general timeline of life, how you, you know, meet Gary, who, who was in this band that you didn't know anything about in 1974. You know what I mean? You're like, oh, okay, you're just a guy in the band. You know, this is a cool band. I don't know. You build a friendship. You stay in touch all these years. You reconnect over the years, and then, and then come together uh, as as a, as a couple in 2018. Then for him to 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 give the pictures to Bruce, to Bruce give us not only his blessing but to write the forward for the book and all these other people. And the poster coming. I mean, it really. Do you feel like this was meant to be? Right? It was this. Was this something oh, that I was? Mean, oh, I I absolutely. I mean, I've always. I don't want to forget about telling you about Bob Santilli, but before I do that, I've always, I know this about myself. Everything that's happened to me in my life that's been successful has been an opportunity that's presented itself, not because I beat myself up trying to make it happen. And nothing has ever, nothing in my life has ever come because I just tried to make it work. Anything like that just was doomed (laughs) from the beginning. So. Anything, anything that came to me once, once I got the job working for Ron Scott and his studio, everything from that point on just it was flowed for me in my life. Uh, there were things that didn't work out so well, you know, in my personal life, but as far as my work and all that, and my, my, some of my outside interests, that all just fell in place and, and was seamless. Um, even my real estate career, I mean, that just was happened that somebody offered me a desk if I'd go get my real estate license. Well, I needed to work, but I'm an art student, you know, I was like, <laughs> what do you do? Well, I had run some, I had run a photography business. I had done, I'd done enough things. I'd worked in my ex-husband's design office. I mean, I, there were certain things I was very good at. And one of them was like connecting the dots, you know, networking. And I knew people from everybody I knew. I had all these different connections. I have so many connections over so many years in so many different places. And so when I started selling real estate in Sonoma and I, I didn't fit into the mold of a, of your typical real estate agent doing things a certain way by the book. I had and I had to I had a, developed a certain image for myself. I, I, there were certain things I loved about what I did, and I really capitalized on that, like putting my jeans and boots on and going to work to sell country property. That's what I wanted to do. I, selling a house in town, I'll do that. But I, my love was the land and and being out there, and I became very very good at it. And I never did it for the money. The money came as a result, and there was a lot of money to be made. So it it put me in a position to be able to retire, to take care of myself without anybody else's assistance or help or worry, and also gave me the ability to be able to publish my own book on my own terms. 
because it's yeah. not, it's a very expensive process to do a book of this quality. So well, why was that to important be... to you to, to, to publish it yourself? Uh, we've talked well, about that a little bit, but I'd, I'd like for you to go over that again, if you don't mind, because I think that's, I, that's I will, but before I do, I don't want to forget to mention, I met Bob Santelli mm -hmm. here at the house during COVID, and he and Gary were sitting out on the screen and porch in the back, you know, following all these protocols during COVID. They were talking about, you know, and he, Bob kept talking about the early days. And all the early times with Bruce, you know, they, he had known them since the early 70s. He's now the executive director of the Bruce Springsteen Archives. And he's, um, he's done all the Grammy museums and music experience museums. He's written books. He's, he's just, he's a prolific writer. And when they got, anyway, they got through, and, and not to mention a good friend of Gary's and the, and the band, he, when they got through their, with their meeting, I said, would you be interested in seeing some pictures from that time? And he goes, you have some? And I said, yes. And he said, I'd love to. So I showed him and he went nuts. And he said, what do you need? And he needs, I'll help you. And I said, I need a writer. You know, I, was, I can't do this. You know, I don't write. I'm not a, I'm not a great writer. Uh, and, um, and he, so he, agreed to do the piece for the book. And he wrote about a 4,000 word historical piece. And then Gary wrote his. And so now I have the writing for the book. That's all these things that Rocky Kenworthy had told me I needed that freaked me out, <laughs> that made me pull back. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Now I had it. So going back to the publishing part, um, I talked to, I knew nothing about publishing a book. It was really a, a kind of a painful learning process, actually. It was very awkward for me to be going into something I didn't know. I like, I like to know what I'm doing. Sure. And yeah. I, so uh, I talked to a couple of publishers that I met through Yolanda. And what became very clear to me is they wanted control of how much money would be spent you know, filling in all those pages, not having those blank pages, you know, suggesting, you know, what the covers should be like. And they never would have spent the money that I spent on this book to make it what it is. They, they would have put, they would have had control over who printed it. I mean, all of that. And, and in the end, I, I'd also found out how much the artists or the photographers uh, had made on their books that went through a publisher, it was, it was nothing. It yeah. was like under $10,000, you know, it was like not even worth doing for that. But I also realized that what these were, what they were doing was they were, the book was a, a presentation of their work. So they could sell their prints because a gallery would sell the prints and they, that's how they would really make any kind of money at all. Uh, but certainly not from book sales. Uh, and, so and it really sounds like it, it would have compromised your creative vision, you know, totally. and, and the control would have been out of your hands. And it, do you feel like at that point, it wouldn't have even really been your book anymore? No, it wouldn't yeah. have been. And, yeah. and, and what was, so, what I'd like to say about that is that, you know, it was, it was interesting after I did, I did this little uh, speech at, uh, and Q and a at uh, Monmouth when the book was first released back in January of last year. And I was a little nervous about having, first of all, I've never done anything like that before. And I was nervous that I would, wouldn't have that much to say, but it was interesting how 45 minutes went by so quickly. The feedback I got, from a number of people, especially women, was how inspired they were that a 26-year-old woman with a baby would have, would be able to do something like that, to go out and shoot these pictures. And But it really is much more than that to me. And it, it, I mean, that was easy to do because, you know, you're 26, you do do pretty much anything without much thinking about it because you're pretty fearless and you don't know enough to be scared. You know, you just do stuff. True. And especially if you're a single mom, you have to just keep putting one foot in front of the other. And for me, the going to Liberty Hall was kind of like going on a little 
you know, it was a nice place for me to go and do something that I enjoyed without having to worry about spending money because I didn't have money to spend. I didn't have, I didn't have any money. I just had enough to get by. So uh, what, but what's more important to me is that I feel that this book and what I've done with this book should be an inspiration for women, my age, women or people, or not even women, my age, just anyone who, who wants to do something for themselves. And because I had always supported other creative uh, artists and I had always and, and taken care of my clients. It was in the service industry, but real estate, I'd always taken care, taking care of my daughter, taking care of other people all my life. And this is something I got to do for myself. And, but at the same time, it, which is one of the reasons why it had to be done as well as I could possibly do it. I had this one shot to do this and do it well. And I did it for myself, but I, it had to be something also that the fans could afford. And I knew that I was not going to be able to charge enough for the book to recoup my money, but I still wanted the, it to be accessible to the fans. And I just yeah. figured, well, maybe I'll make some money on some prints, you know, uh, eventually. But I think it's very uh, cool and, that you that you had that in mind when you were thinking about that. And and to touch on what you just said a moment ago, I com- I completely agree with that. And I, it's funny you say that because I was going to bring that up and ask you how you felt about that. It is very inspirational, I think, uh, to to for you to have you know done this, you know, when you were in your twenties and 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 taking these iconic uh, photographs. And then 50 years later, turn it into this beautiful book, this beautiful piece of art. And what I think is so interesting about it is it's it's incredible for two reasons, at least two reasons. But one, it is it is this incredible piece now of the 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 50 year conversation of Bruce Springsteen and E Street Band and his bands and his fans. It is it is, it is part of that legacy now forever. And also, it is your own story, your own legacy, your own art. And and so it contributes to this grand story, this grand relationship that between the fans and, and the E Street Band, but also stands alone as something I think that that is that is yours and your story and your personal story of especially after talking about it with you, this fifty year journey of your own. Yes, and I I would say um, not everybody has the means to be able to do something like this, but there are ways of getting there without having to compromise, without having to go to a publisher. You could do a you could do a GoFundMe. You can do all kinds of things. You can raise um, money to do this, and and that's I considered that, and it's yeah. something I could have done. But I was maybe too lazy to do it, or I don't know what. But I just, um, uh, I really didn't know what, I, like I said, I didn't really know what I was doing. So um, I will say this in terms of the quality of the book. I had a lot of faith in Yolanda. She she found Chuck Kelton to do those beautiful prints that, would ne- the book would not have been the same quality without every step along the way being carefully thought out and carefully uh and and the quality put into it in the, from the get go and so the 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 black and white images were uh all prints done from the original ne- negative archival silver gelatin prints and then those were scanned and both the prints and the scans were sent to the printer in Venice in Venice Italy where you have a generational printing company that is committed always to quality. I mean, a, a quality and an expertise that we just, I just don't see in other places. You know, this is, right. so when I saw the first proofs of the, of the uh, book, my jaw dropped. I mean, I expected something really good, really beautiful, but not that. It just blew me away. 
it, they were the 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 print quality and the printing quality of that book. I couldn't have asked for more. It's just stunning. It blew me away. So I, I can't imagine what it does for some people. The other the other thing that was really that really made me realize that how important these decisions were along the way. One was not to have a lot of printing or a lot of copy anywhere near the photograph itself because I wanted the photograph to really just say it all. So there would be very few pull quotes and the uh and and everybody knows who's in the picture, so you don't have to say this is a picture of so and so. <laughs> so so the index in the back made a whole lot of sense because there were a few people that someone might be wondering, like, who's that? You know. Um so getting those photographs as big as possible on the page, and in some cases, no photograph next to it. And so what I remember, we went out to dinner. Gary and I went out to dinner at a friend's house, and and um, and his friend said to me, Nikki, I really don't know much about this sort of thing, but I just love the blank pages. He said, it just makes helps me really see this photograph. Yes, yes. That was your vision. Yes. That's what that was right. your vision. Yeah. I mean, how many times do you go through a book and there's a, one photograph right after another, and then they all start kind of blending together? And then how do you remember that image unless it just smacked you in the face and that there it is? And that's that. That's exactly what I knew I had to do. Whether somebody I, I appreciated it or not, but the fact that so many people have mentioned that, so many people have said that, says you don't have to know good design. You do not have to know that much about photography. You don't have to know these things, but you know it when you see it. I love that so much. And I love that you stayed true to what you wanted. That's, I yes. think that's so, that's so important. Um, I'm very, I'm very, very proud of this book. Yeah. I'm very you proud have, of it. I'm going to ask you a couple more questions about that in a minute, but I want to uh, go back a little bit to something that you and I talked about last week. And I think that it's important uh, to talk about uh, in relation to, you know, your artistic vision and how you ended up the person you are. And I think you had a very uh, fascinating upbringing uh, traveling around and, and so many different experiences. So let's, let's touch on that a little bit. Uh, I know your father was in the, the military, uh, some really interesting stories there as well. My father was, I, I truly believe that I am the person I am today because of my relationship with my father. And I only had him with me until I was 18. He passed away when I was 18 years old. It was a very tragic death. It was life-changing. Um, but up until that time, his influences, and even I would say even after death, his influences have been it meant everything to me in terms of who I turn out to be. Um, my father grew up in Texas and um, his, they were comfortable enough, not a lot of money, but comfortable enough. My granddaddy, who was a, my other favorite person, had an eighth grade education, but he was able to become a pharmacist. It's wow. interesting. So wow. he, he had his own drugstore and they moved from Corsicana, Texas to West Texas, where my dad went to school and from the time he was seven. And he fell in love with flying. How, I don't know, but he that was it. And he also had a, an ability, he had a lot of artistic ability. He could draw, he could, he could do anything. It was back in the day when a country boy like that, you could ask, you could, they could do anything you asked them to do, whether it was fix a car or go fishing or hunting or whatever. They could pretty much do anything, the most capable of men. And um, he also was a very loving person. And he was and he was extremely, extremely handsome. But he didn't know it. He just didn't know how good looking he was. And my uncle was the same way. And he wound up going to uh, Texas A&M and studying uh, architecture and engineering. And this was right at the time that World War II was just started. The, our boys were just starting to get trained for for going to war. And uh, uh, so when he graduated in 41, he went to California and became uh, a cadet in training at uh, for the Army Air Corps. And he graduated top of his class 
they would not send those guys into combat. They had them become instructors. And plus they had my dad designing runways. He really wanted to go, but his CO loved him, didn't want him to go and knew he wouldn't come back. They would have been sent to South Pacific. So uh, he wound up staying in California during most of the war, uh, uh, training other pilots and, uh, and investigating crash sites. The interesting thing about that is he always had a camera with him. And, uh, and it, and it kind of makes sense, you know, he's in, and pilots are interesting guys, you know, they're very, very organized and careful and detailed to thank, thank heavens. And, um, and so I always remember my dad having a camera and, and I remember, and he has I have all these albums of photographs he took during that time. Uh, my mother and dad met, met in Southern California. My mother was from North, North Dakota. And uh, after the war, he got stationed in Natal, Brazil, brought my mom down there, uh, had, her, had her fly down there back in the day when you had to make several stops to get down there. And they got married there. And uh, I think I got started there. <laughs> and, then, <laughs> and, and then it, from that point on, uh, throughout our lives, uh, he, oh, and then he stayed in the military when the, when the, the uh, Army Air Corps became the Army and the Air Force. He stayed in and, and stayed in as an Air Force, career Air Force officer. He, again, kid, country boy from Texas, loved to fly. That meant everything to him. Flying and his family. Those are the two things. So I won't go through all the places we lived, but I, but after, when we got back to the, well, maybe I will. <laughs> we got back to the States. We, they moved to Florida where I was born and we were there very briefly. And then he got stationed in the Azores and uh, we went to the Azores where my sister was born. That's my first visual memory is the Azores. I was three when we left. And I just remember it was such a, it, it, it's interesting. Pete Seuss's family's from the Azores. I, that's, we have that little thing in common besides photography. And um, when we got back, we went to, from there to Massachusetts where my brother was born. So there's three of us and there's a five year age difference between me and my brother. My sister is about not quite two years younger <clears> than me. <throat> and from there, we went to Anchorage, Alaska, where I went to first and second grade. I remember these places so well. I'm, I think I was basically born visual. You know, yeah. everything I notice and see, I rem and you can even almost see it in my baby pictures. I'm just looking and looking at everything, <laughs> you know, just and taking it in. I don't wasn't this sort of happy, crazy little baby. I was more intense. It's almost like there was an intensity there from the get go. <laughs> little so, baby. <laughs> um, so we wound up in 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 Alaska in the early fifties. Uh, and, uh, then from there we went to Texas, uh, so all over the place, you know, and yeah. every place was an adventure. I went to a different school almost every year, sometimes two schools a year. I never saw it as a problem. It was kind of, it was always an adventure. It was our life. We were used to it. Yeah. And, um, then we went to, uh, we, my dad was uh, transferred to C-118 school for uh, about six weeks in back in West Palm Beach, Florida, where I was born. And, uh, and then we, we were stationed, he was stationed at McGuire Force Base in New Jersey. So sixth, seventh and part of eighth grade, I was in New Jersey. And one day uh, we, I came home from school, I came home and my dad had a globe on the dining room table. and. Um, he, we, when we, when we found out we were moving, typically we, dad would say, we're going somewhere, we're going here, we're going there, you know, and it was easy because the service packed us up and unpacked us, did all that it was an easy move. So we get home and he said, we're going to have a little meeting. And he, um, he said, uh, how would y'all like to go to Iran? <laughs> and we, go, we go, we go. He never lost his Texas accent. And so um, we said, cool, where, you know, where's that? And he spun the globe around and pointed. And we said, great. Well, going to Iran as an Air Force officer back then, my dad's rank, meant that you were going to be 
the air attache to Iran, which is a diplomatic post. You are the U United States Air Force representative to that country. And we were supposed to be there for two years. So before you go, they typically send you to uh, language training school, and then they send you to diplomatic training, both husband and wife, and then they send you to your post. It's a very, very prestigious sought after post in the service, whether it's Navy, Army, Air Force. It's, it's a very cushy job for people that are living in base housing to all of yeah. a sudden living like an ambassador for whatever period of time you're there doesn't last but, but for when you're there it's a very very nice life so uh, we didn't um, we didn't really know what we were getting ourselves into not as kids but my parents knew so they go off to um they go they had they fast-tracked him they didn't send him to language training they sent him immediately to washington dc for diplomatic training so uh in the november of 1961 uh, I was a freshman in high school. We went to Iran as a family, and we moved into this beautiful home and beautiful pool and the servants and all this. And uh, I just remember when we landed at the Mirabad airport, all I saw was everything was like sand color. Everything was beige until you get behind the compound walls where it's like a Persian garden. As soon as you water anything and turns green and then you have all these beautiful uh fruit trees and gardens and roses and it's just beautiful wow yeah I sounds like it i won't go into all the the incredible experiences i had up there but i will say that you know we were weren't there two years we were there four years my dad was asked to stay for a double tour of duty and uh it was there there's a term that i learned uh later on much later on called third culture kids third culture kids are uh kids that grow up in an in a in an environment a foreign environment for a, a period of time that has a, a definite impact on their lives you know and i would say i i was definitely that third culture kid when I graduated from high school in 1965, and we were coming back to the States that summer. I didn't want to leave. I was so happy where I was, and I had such a great life there. Um, I went to school with 28 nationalities, seven different religions, and at a Presbyterian mission school of all places where everybody got along. Everybody, and we're still friends today. We're still That's friends. Incredible. And I wish every kid had that experience. I wish the world would be such a different place. Yeah, I couldn't agree and, more. To have that experience at, at that age, uh, there's no way that that, that couldn't have it, had such an impact on you. You know, and I'm and I'm. It was it, it was remarkable, and I, I'm not saying it didn't have certain challenges, but sure. when you're a kid, you know, you can. You thrive. And, and as a, a kid growing up in the service like that, you tend to be a little of a chameleon. You sort of want to blend in wherever you are. I remember coming back to the States. I'm in Texas. I'm going to school. I'm going to school. And at the first year, I went to SMU in Dallas, which was a very, very conservative school. And all the girls were wearing like these pastel colors and, and bouffant hairdos. And, and uh, I was wearing all neutral colors because I blend in in Iran you don't you you are uh you know black and grays and stuff like that that's how you fit in on the street and um and uh uh not that there wasn't fashion and all that kind of stuff there there was believe me back in those days it was it was very very cool the Shah was trying to westernize Iran and doing a pretty darn good job of it and uh so what happened later on with the revolution when Khomeini was brought back to Iran, he was exiled when I was there during the 63 revolution. So we were there during the white revolution, but when he was brought oh, wow. back and, and then Khomeini came back, I, it was heartbreaking to see what was going to happen to women. And uh, it, it, it was just tragic. It, and it still is, of course, because the Iranian people are just wonderful people. They're, they're really amazing. And uh, they just, have a lousy government, what can I say? 
So um, uh, that period of time left such a huge impression on me going forward. So when I saw that Bruce came to Houston with three black players in his band, didn't occur yeah. to me that that would be an issue. Sure. It just didn't. L let me ask you, um, just real quick here. This is the first time that I've talked to you that you mentioned that your that your father would carry a camera around with him. I didn't know that in all the phot photography. Is that something that you and 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 he shared uh, that you guys talked about and connected over while you he was still with us, or was that something that you realized that you had a passion for later on? Well, he actually gave me my first camera. I think I was eleven. He gave okay, me a brownie. There you go. There you go. He gave me a brownie camera. I don't have the brownie anymore, but I've got some of the pictures. They're pretty bad. That's, but, so, that's so cool. But there's though. a few there. There's a couple there. I go, oh, they may not be in focus or any of that, but that's not a pretty good composition. I, I, <laughs> you can see you can see the, uh, yeah. the connection. And then yeah. my, um, uh, he, my dad actually taught me how to draw in perspective back when I was about seven years old. He, he always gave me, if I was interested in doing something, he always gave me the tools good tools to do it well. Like if I said I was interested in doing watercolors, which I wanted to try because my dad did watercolors. Yeah. So uh, he didn't give me a little paint thing from the dime store. He gave me tube paints and he gave me good brushes and good watercolor <laughs> paper. And so I could do it right. I still have my first watercolor. It may be my only watercolor. It was really cool but, though. Uh, but he, it's an iris in a glass, you know, I, I still have it. Um, so, uh, if you look in the back of my book, you'll see that I dedicated the book to my father and there's a picture of him. I'm sure it's when he was in college and he's sitting on the steps of one of the building and he's got the, his, his camera up to his face. I wouldn't be surprised if that's the same camera that he was using when I was in high school. It was a it was an Argus that he eventually gave me when he bought a Leica. And, uh, and uh, I remember after he died, my mother sold the Leica. I was heartbroken. Just, she didn't know. She didn't sure. know what it meant. But sure. I would have given anything to have that camera today. So it's Just such a beautiful connection that you guys shared. And, and, and you know, the story of, uh, you know, him uh, having a love for, uh, for photography all the way to you doing this book today, I think is, is a beautiful connection and that's inspirational in and of itself. Um, uh, real quick, before I let you go, tell everybody where they can find this book if they want to purchase a copy for themselves. Well, it's been a challenge, uh, but uh, it, for some people outside of the U S to get the book, but we'll talk about that for a second. First of all, for the U.S. fans and people that are interested, going to www.springsteenlibertyhall.com. You can order a book if you do it while I'm here and while Gary's here. We'll both sign it and get it out to you right away. Just let us know who it's for. Is it for yourself or for somebody else? Because a lot of people have been buying books for friends. And sure. um, yeah. I had a friend here who bought 16 books at Christmas time. He said it was the easiest Christmas shopping he ever done. <laughs> Everybody I like that. loved it. I like that. And so I said, here, maybe 16 books, all, all personalized. And then um, uh, is a challenge. It's very, very expensive to ship overseas. I'm having a lot of trouble understanding how to do it. I'm working on that now, trying to find a, a better way, especially to Australia, which is really hard to do. But when I had the books shipped out from Italy, I had half of them shipped to, uh, to a fulfillment center in the Netherlands. Okay. And uh, and then the rest of them were shipped to the U.S. I think we've sold more than half of the books here in the U.S. Uh, most of the books, the majority, are still in in the Netherlands. So um, I'm not planning. I have one book signing here in on March 7th here in Nashville that will uh, be posted on Facebook uh, that a friend offered to do for me. 
host, he's hosting it and I'm just waiting for him to come up with the details. But uh, that was sort of last minute. That just came up like a couple of days ago. Um, Cause I really haven't had a major book signing in Nashville yet. Interestingly enough. And then um, when I, but once I get on the, on the, on the road, I'm not doing any book signs in the United States. It's too difficult to get a bookstore to commit. Uh, they don't want to pay my wholesale price and I can't afford to do it for less. So sure. that's part of the issue. Um, there are some books at Monmouth Bookstore in New Jersey, but people in the U.S. can get a personally signed book. Easy. It's easy. That's awesome. Not, uh, and, and I'll post the link yeah. there for everybody uh, whenever uh, this is up. If you look in the, the description of the episode, then I'll post they, that as well. So now. In Europe, I'm working really hard along with some great folks in Europe to set up some book signings there. So here's what I'm going to say to those people that are listening to this. Number one, if you're in the UK, the best place to order a book right now is through Badlands or go to one of their book signings. So what I'm going to do when we get when we get to Cardiff. Uh, which is the first show in Europe, we're, we're hoping to have a book signing there in Cardiff the day before the show. That'll be through Badlands. Philip jumped there. And I will sign as many books as I can so that even if there's some books left over, that he'll have those back uh, at, uh, oh, very at cool. Badlands. Very cool. Some of them. He's And then um, definitely having a book signing in Dublin, and we're working on possibly having one in Belfast and possibly one in Cork. But Dublin for sure. And um, thanks to Tom McCormick, who's just best guy. And um, and then um, we have a commitment for a book signing in Stockholm. We had a great book signing last year uh, in uh, Gothenburg. And there's more, more to come on that very, very soon. That's, that's a firm commitment. Dublin's a firm commitment. There will be a, uh, there will, there's another firm commitment. In the Netherlands, at Amster- in Amsterdam, Concerto Records hosted a book signing last year. They sold probably more books than anyone. Oh, wow. And um, they're going to, what I've suggested to them, because it's almost impossible to get signed books out to the EU. For, I can't do it from the Fulfillment Center. But I'm suggesting to Concerto for them to have as many signed books on hand as they can, as they can accommodate so that they can take pre-orders or they can take uh, or, and take orders even after we've left. We're going to have a book signing at Concerto Records, but it'll be in Amsterdam. The shows are okay. not in Amsterdam, but we're going to be there long enough that uh, we'll be able to do at least one book signing there. And uh, Very exciting. They will have books available. If you can't make a book signing and you're in the EU, you'll be able to order a book from Concerto Records. Okay. Uh, there is a confirm there is a commitment with Badlands to do a, a book signing in London. And we're working on a book signing in Madrid. Haven't had any book signings in Spain and You're gonna be busy. Wanna... You're gonna be busy. Yes. I'm I'm but, committed to doing this I, I because love it. I really it's a good thing. And as you have to <laughs> hoping to have one in Barcelona, hoping to have one in Madrid details are not nowhere near close to getting will everybody be able to find that by going to the website not well i wasn't planning on putting it on my website but i will put it on social media uh uh, i can forward links it will be other people putting on on these book signings i show up they order the books they put everything i just show up so concerto records did an incredible job of get of promoting it last year and and as a result, they sold like 140 books or something like that, and and we had a nice. huge turnout yeah, at the book turnout. signing, and they had very short notice. So I anticipate with this much notice, I also want to get it out there soon enough because when people make their travel plans, I they I heard enough people say, "Gee, I already had my flight booked and I couldn't make it," and I want them to know before they make their flights or before they can change a flight or whatever, if they really want to come to a book signing that they can. They can schedule around it. Yeah. Well, that's that's wonderful. It's almost impossible. It's, it's really impossible for me to schedule book signings where we only have one show. And unless I can turn around too quick. Yeah. 
it depends, you know, on when we, sh when we get there, like in Cork, we're, I don't think we'll get there until sometime in that afternoon. So it's really kind yeah. of dicey. Like, will I be able to make a book signing book the, the day before a show? I can't then, do it. Then it becomes too stressful to have to worry about that. Yeah, I think, I think the way you're handling it. It's really fun. Makes sense. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Cork, uh, Cardiff we can do, because I know we'll be there in time to be able to do one in Cardiff. Yeah. Even though it's probably well, going to be on my birthday. This, this <laughs> sounds great. I think I'm, I'm going to put the link for everybody to at least find it on, on the website here in the States. And then, you know, anybody that's overseas listening to this, uh, you know, check I, back in with I, me I, or Mickey on the want, socials and we can we can in the right direction. I also want to say, I, I forgot to mention, we are having a book signing in Toronto. And I'm hoping okay. that they'll also be able to accommodate sending books out to parts of Canada. And I'm trying to see if there's someone in, in uh, um, Australia that will uh, bookstore someone that will import some books. I'm that'd that'd be that. great. Yeah, that'd be great. Well, listen, Nikki, thank you uh, so much. This was such a great conversation. You have uh, led such an interesting life so far. And what you're doing with this <laughs> so book, far. I think, is incredibly <laughs> beautiful. It's inspiring. Um, and I can't wait to see, uh, uh, you know, the whole band on tour this next year. And then, uh, I'm going to get myself a copy of this book real soon. So I can't, I, I can't wait for all that. Yeah. Well, it's, uh, it's been really nice of you to have me on Jesse. Thank you. I really yeah, appreciate it's been a pleasure. it. Hope Thanks I for sharing your stories. It's been really fun to talk to you. Um, can't thank you enough. And, um, for everybody listening, I'm going to post the, uh, the info on how to get this book. Uh, in the in the comments, I'm going to post about it, make it real easy for everybody to find it. Uh, the, uh, Bruce Springsteen and, and Band, I guess. What's the official title of the book? Is it Bruce Springsteen, it Liberty Hall, or is it Bruce Springsteen and Band? And Band? It, says, it said and Band, and it said, and it said uh, concerto. You know, it was like, it's a yeah. funny poster. Roberto was Hispanic, you know, so it had a little that flair it's to funny. it. But, um, yeah, Bruce... Uh, the next time Bruce came around, Max and Roy were with him when he came back to Texas. For yeah, they it was were, a little, little different the next time around. They only been yeah. with him for like a month or so when they came back. I think it happened pretty quick after they joined the band. I love so it. it's really yeah, it's, captured a moment. Captures a moment in time. Springsteen, Liberty Hall, Nikki. Thank you so much. Uh, this has been a pleasure. Uh, thanks everybody for listening. I'm your host Jesse Hubbard. This is Sound Out. Until next time, friends. Thanks, Jesse. Thanks.